Welcome to this Your God conversation at UTS, hosted by Credo. Our motto is Christ for UTS. And we have special guests, Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Peter Slazak. Thank you to everyone who's come along for what I trust will be an engaging time of learning and listening and interacting even together. That was a good tone that we set out there with uh, some snacks. My name is Paul Winch and I'm a graduate advisor uh, to Credo. The last time I stood on this stage was when I received my degree and it's a great honour to be standing back up here. As the person who's been communicating over the last few months with our guests, um, I get to be the main upfront host tonight. Now we've not planned tonight as a show, it's not entertainment for uni students, it's not Credo having a big gig. Now our intent tonight is to genuinely engage with really important questions uh, with respect, with authenticity and with integrity. Let me very briefly and without much fanfare, because we are in Australia after all, introduce our special guests. Fitting our conversational tone and format tonight, I've asked if we can call them Bill, is that all right? And Peter, yes. and uh, that's a very Australian thing to do. And uh, both Bill and Peter have numerous uh, academic qualifications, including doctorates in philosophy. They publish widely in a range of media, from the more popular to the highly credentialed uh, academic journals. Bill is well known uh, as a Christian apologist who amongst his lecturing and adjunct professorship speaking, he runs the Reasonable Faith Ministry and joins us tonight from his home in Atlanta, Georgia. And Peter is Associate Professor in Philosophy, School of Humanities at UNSW, and he joins us tonight from Sydney's eastern suburbs. So let's give them a hearty UTS welcome. I paraphrase, if Christ did not rise from death, Christians should be pitied. Their faith is empty, all their empathy for Jesus misplaced. So wrote Paul of Tarsus, also called Paul the Apostle, to some Christians in the Greek city of Corinth about 50 AD. Bill will be our plenary speaker tonight, presenting for 30 minutes, asking the question, did Jesus rise? Peter has graciously agreed to be a commentator. Following Bill, Peter will give a brief critique from an atheist's perspective, highlighting just some of what he sees as the weaknesses in Bill's presentation. I think it is a mark of Peter's generosity for, the, for a man who could command our attention for over an hour and have equal fitting for Bill that Peter has assured me that he'll speak uh, for just 15 minutes. And that's really excellent because tonight is not really about them. Tonight is for us, for you. And without further ado, let's hear Bill's plenary presentation, followed by Peter's short critique. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm uh, delighted to have the opportunity to present this lecture this evening and am especially grateful for Professor Slazek's willingness to uh, share his commentary on it. The question before us is, did Jesus rise from the dead? And I'm going to explain why I answer yes to this question. There are at least two ways to a knowledge of Jesus' resurrection, the existential and the historical. Tonight I want to focus on the historical case for Jesus' resurrection. Now, I've realized that the vast majority of Christians have not based their belief in Jesus' resurrection on historical considerations, but rather on a personal encounter with the living Lord himself. And I think that this existential approach is fully legitimate. But I also think that a good case can be made historically for Jesus' resurrection as well. Now, one doesn't come to a study of Jesus' resurrection in a vacuum. So let me lay out very clearly two presuppositions with which I approach tonight's question. First, I presuppose the existence of God, as demonstrated by the arguments of natural theology, 
such as the cosmological, teleological, and axiological arguments. This is the approach taken by classical defenders of the resurrection, such as Hugo Grotius, Samuel Clark, and William Paley, as well as by such contemporary scholars as Wolfhard Pannenbach, Richard Swinburne, and Stephen Davis. And it's the approach that I've adopted in my published work. Anyone who is an atheist or an agnostic doesn't share this presupposition. Neither do pantheists, such as Buddhists or some Hindus. This is a huge difference, which will, of course, radically affect how we assess competing explanations of the facts. But our time and topic are limited tonight, so if we want to talk about the existence of God, we'll have to take that up during the Q&A. Second, I presuppose that our background knowledge includes a good deal of information about the historical Jesus, including his radical personal claims, his teaching, and his crucifixion. In so doing, I stand squarely in the mainstream of New Testament scholarship concerning the historical Jesus. Again, I realize that Muslims, for example, do not share this presupposition. Most Muslims believe that Jesus proclaimed a simple message of monotheism and that he was not, in fact, crucified. This, however, is a position which is so extreme that it is not defended by any historian. To call it marginal would be an understatement. It doesn't even appear on the map of contemporary scholarship. So I'm also very safely situated with respect to my second presupposition. Now, a historical case for Jesus' resurrection will involve two steps. First, determining what is the evidence to be explained, and second, inferring which explanation of the evidence is the best explanation. With respect to that first step, the first thing we need to do in order to conduct a historical investigation of Jesus is to assemble our sources. Jesus of Nazareth is referred to in a range of ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament including Christian, Roman, and Jewish sources. This is really quite extraordinary when you reflect what a relatively obscure figure Jesus of Nazareth was, having had at most a three-year public life as an itinerant Galilean preacher. We have far more information about Jesus than we do for most major figures of antiquity. The most important of these historical sources have been collected into the New Testament. References to Jesus outside the New Testament tend to confirm what we read in the Gospels, but they don't really tell us anything new. Therefore, the focus of our investigation must be upon the documents found in the New Testament. So try not to think of the New Testament as a single book. Try to think of it as what it originally was, just a bunch of separate documents written in the Greek language, handed down out of the first century, telling this remarkable story of Jesus of Nazareth. The question then must be, how historically reliable are these documents with respect to the fate of Jesus of Nazareth? Let's look first then at the evidence to be explained and then at the best explanation of that evidence. It seems to me, as a result of my research, that the evidence establishes three independent facts. Jesus' empty tomb, Jesus' appearances alive after his death, and the very origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. If these three facts can be established, and if no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts can account for them, as well as the resurrection hypothesis, then we're justified in affirming that second step, that Jesus' resurrection is the best explanation of the facts. So let's examine the evidence supporting each of these three facts. Fact number one, 
On the Sunday after the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Here I'll summarize briefly five lines of evidence which have led most scholars to affirm this fact. One, the historical reliability of the burial story supports the empty tomb. Now you might ask, how does the fact of Jesus' burial prove that his tomb was found empty? The answer is this. If the burial story is basically accurate, then the location of Jesus' tomb was known in Jerusalem to both Jew and Christian alike, since both were present when Jesus was laid in the tomb. But in that case, the tomb must have been empty when the disciples began to preach that Jesus was risen. Why? Well, first, the disciples could not have believed in Jesus' resurrection if his corpse still lay in the tomb. It would have been wholly un-Jewish, not to say stupid, to believe that a man was raised from the dead when his body was known to still be in the grave. Second, even if the disciples had preached Jesus' resurrection despite his occupied tomb, scarcely anyone else would have believed them. One of the most remarkable facts about the early Christian belief in Jesus' resurrection was that it flourished in the very city where Jesus had been publicly crucified. So long as the people of Jerusalem thought that Jesus' body was in the tomb, few would have been prepared to believe such nonsense as that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And third, even if they had so believed, the Jewish authorities would have exposed the whole affair by simply pointing to Jesus' occupied tomb or perhaps even exhuming the body as decisive proof that Jesus had not been raised. Thus, if the story of Jesus' burial is historical, then it's a very short inference to the fact of the empty tomb as well. For that reason, critics who deny the empty tomb also feel compelled to argue against the burial. Unfortunately for them, Jesus' burial in the tomb is one of the best established facts about Jesus. According to the late John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University, the burial of Jesus in the tomb is one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus. But if this conclusion is correct, then, as I've explained, it's very difficult to deny the fact of the empty tomb. Number two, the empty tomb is multiply attested by independent early sources. Mark's source for the story of Jesus' suffering and death, the so-called passion story, probably didn't end with Jesus' burial, but with the women's discovery of the empty tomb. For the burial story and the empty tomb story are really one story, forming a smooth, continuous narrative. They're linked by grammatical and linguistic ties. Further, it seems unlikely that early Christians would have circulated a story of Jesus' passion ending in his burial. The passion story is incomplete without victory at the end. Hence, Mark's source probably included and may have ended with the discovery of the empty tomb. Moreover, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul quotes from an extremely early tradition dating from within the first five years after Jesus' death that also refers to Christ's burial and resurrection. Here is what Paul says. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Although the empty tomb is not explicitly mentioned in the formula, a comparison of this four-line formula with the narratives in the Gospels on the one hand and the sermons in the Acts of the Apostles on the other reveals that the third line is in fact a summary of the empty tomb story. We have then extraordinarily early independent evidence for the fact of Jesus' empty tomb. The discovery of Jesus' empty tomb cannot be written off as a later legendary development. But there's more. 
For once again, there are good reasons to discern independent sources for the empty tomb in the other Gospels and Acts. For example, Matthew is clearly working with an independent source, for he includes the story of the guard at the tomb, which is unique to his Gospel. Moreover, his statement about how the rumor that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body has been spread among Jews until this day shows that Matthew is responding to prior tradition. Luke also has an independent source, for he tells the story, not found in Mark, of two disciples visiting the tomb to verify the women's report that the tomb was vacant. The story can't be regarded as Luke's creation since the incident is independently reported by John. And again, given John's independence of the other three Gospels, we have yet another independent report of the empty tomb. Finally, in the sermons in the book of Acts, we again have indirect references to the empty tomb. For example, Peter draws the sharp contrast David died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, but this Jesus God raised up. Historians think that they have hit historical pay dirt when they have two independent accounts of the same event. But in the case of the empty tomb, we have no less than six and some of these are among the earliest materials to be found in the New Testament. Number three is that the tomb was probably discovered empty by women. In order to appreciate this point, we need to understand two things about the place of women in Jewish society. First, women were not regarded as credible witnesses. This attitude toward the testimony of women is evident in the Jewish historian Josephus' description of the rules for admissible testimony. He says, let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. No such regulation is to be found in the Bible. It is rather a reflection of the patriarchal culture of first century Judaism. Second, women occupied a low rung on the Jewish social ladder. Compared to men, women were second-class citizens. Consider these rabbinical texts. Sooner let the words of the law be burnt than delivered to women. Or again, blessed is he whose children are male, but woe to him whose children are female. The daily prayer of every Jewish man included the blessing Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has not created me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. So given their low social status and inability to serve as legal witnesses, it's quite amazing that it is women who are the discoverers of and principal witnesses to the empty tomb. If the empty tomb story were a late legend, then certainly male disciples would have been made to be the ones who discovered the empty tomb. The fact that women whose testimony was deemed worthless were the chief witnesses to the fact of the empty tomb can only be plausibly explained if, like it or not, they were the discoverers of the empty tomb and the gospel writers faithfully record what for them was a very awkward and embarrassing fact. Number four, the story is simple and lacks signs of theological embellishment. In the interest of time, I'll just pass over that point. Five, the earliest Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. And again, in the interest of time, I'm going to simply note that. Taken together, these five lines of evidence constitute a powerful case. The Jesus tomb was indeed found empty on the first day of the week, by a group of his women followers. As a historical fact, this seems to be well established. According to Jakob Kramer, a New Testament critic who has specialized in the study of the resurrection, and I quote, by far, most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb, end quote. 
In fact, in a survey of over 2,200 publications on the resurrection in English, French, and German since 1975, Gary Habermas found that 75% of scholars accepted the historicity of the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb. The evidence is so compelling that even a number of Jewish scholars, such as Pincus Lapid and Geza Vermesh, have declared themselves convinced on the basis of the evidence that Jesus' tomb was found empty. But there's more evidence to come. Fact number two, on different occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul continues, he appeared to Cephas, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. This is a truly remarkable claim. We have here an indisputably authentic letter of a man personally acquainted with the first disciples. And he reports that they actually saw Jesus alive after his death. More than that, he says that he himself saw an appearance of Jesus. What are we to make of this claim? Did Jesus really appear to people alive after his death? Well, once again, time doesn't allow me to go into all the detail concerning the evidence for Jesus' postmortem appearances. You can find this on our website, reasonablefaith.org, where this material is available uh, for your examination free. But I'd like to just briefly mention two main lines of evidence. One, Paul's list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances guarantees that such appearances occurred. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives a list of witnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances that is so early that to speak of legends in this case would be irresponsible. We can treat them as hallucinatory if we want to, but we cannot responsibly deny that these events occurred. These included appearances to Peter or Cephas, the 12, the 500 brethren, and James. Paul's testimony makes it historically certain that various individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus after his death and burial. Two, the gospel accounts provide multiple independent reports of post-mortem appearances of Jesus. The Gospels independently report post-mortem appearances of Jesus, even some of the same appearances mentioned by Paul's list. The appearance to Peter is independently mentioned by Paul and Luke and is universally acknowledged by critics. The appearance to the Twelve is independently reported by Paul, Luke, and John and is again not in dispute. The appearance to the women disciples is independently reported by Matthew and John and enjoys as well ratification by the criterion of embarrassment given the low credibility accorded to the testimony of women. It's generally agreed that the absence of this appearance from the list of appearances in the tradition quoted by Paul is a reflection of the discomfort in citing female witnesses. Finally, that Jesus appeared to the disciples in Galilee is independently reported by Mark, Matthew, and John. From this evidence, what should we conclude? Even the skeptical German critic, Gert Ludemann, is emphatic. He writes, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ, end quote. The evidence makes it certain that on separate occasions, different individuals and groups had experiences of seeing Jesus alive from the dead. Today, this conclusion is virtually undisputed. The third fact to be explained, 
is that the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead despite having every predisposition to the contrary. We all know that Christianity sprang into being sometime midway through the first century after Christ. Why did it come into existence? What caused this movement to begin? Even skeptical New Testament scholars recognize that the Christian faith owes its origin to the belief of the earliest disciples that God had raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. In fact, they pinned nearly everything on this belief. Take just one example. Their belief that Jesus was the Messiah. Jews had no conception of a Messiah who instead of triumphing over Israel's enemies would be shamefully executed by them as a criminal. Messiah was supposed to be a triumphant figure who would command the respect of Jew and Gentile alike and who would establish the throne of David in Jerusalem. A Messiah who failed to deliver and to reign, who was defeated, humiliated, and slain by his enemies is a contradiction in terms. Nowhere do the Jewish texts speak of such a Messiah. Therefore, it's difficult to overemphasize what a disaster the crucifixion was for the disciples' faith. Jesus' death on the cross spelled the humiliating end of any hopes they had entertained that he was the Messiah. But the belief in the resurrection of Jesus reversed the catastrophe of the crucifixion. Because God had raised Jesus from the dead, he was seen to be the Messiah after all. It was on the basis of his belief in the uh, on the basis of the belief in his resurrection the disciples could believe that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. Thus the origin of Christianity hinges on the belief of the earliest disciples that God had raised Jesus from the dead. But the question is then how does one explain the origin of that belief? As R H Fuller says, even the most skeptical critic must posit some mysterious X to get the movement going. But the question was, what was that X? Well, I will skip over my second point about Jewish beliefs precluding the resurrection um, and go on to the second point. To summarize then, we've seen three facts that are acknowledged by the majority of New Testament scholars today concerning the fate of Jesus of Nazareth. One of the things that most astonished me after completing my doctoral research in Munich was the realization that these three great independently established facts represent the majority view of New Testament critics today. These are not the conclusions of conservative scholars. These are the conclusions of mainstream New Testament criticism. As we saw, Three quarters of scholars who have written on the subject accept the fact of the empty tomb. Virtually no one today denies that the earliest disciples experienced post-mortem appearances of Jesus. And by far and away, most scholars agree that the earliest disciples at least believed that God had raised Jesus from the dead. It is the critic who would deny these three facts who today finds himself on the defensive. The remaining issue then is how these three facts I've stated are best explained. I think that the best explanation of the facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. I'll call this the resurrection hypothesis. Historians weigh various factors in assessing competing hypotheses. Some of the most important are as follows. One, the best explanation will have greater explanatory scope than other explanations. That is, it will explain more of the evidence. Two, the best explanation will have greater explanatory power than other explanations. That is, it will make the evidence more probable. Three, the best explanation will be more plausible than other explanations. That is, it will fit better with true background beliefs. Four, the best explanation will be less contrived than other explanations. That is, it won't require adopting as many new beliefs 
which have no independent evidence. Five, the best explanation will be disconfirmed by fewer accepted beliefs than other explanations. That is, it won't conflict with as many accepted beliefs. And six, the best explanation will meet conditions one to five so much better than the others that there's little chance that one of the other explanations after further investigation will do better in meeting these conditions. So, how do naturalistic theories stack up when assessed by these six criteria? Well, not very well, I think. I don't have time to go into detail here. Again, look at the website, reasonablefaith.org, for a full discussion. But let me say that in all honesty, I think that the only reason the skeptic rejects the resurrection hypothesis is because of his aversion to miracles. But if God exists, as my argument presupposes, then how can you say justifiably that it's improbable that God would raise Jesus from the dead? The real question then is this, how open are you to the existence of God? Conclusion. In conclusion, therefore, three great independently established facts, the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith, all point to the same marvelous conclusion that God raised Jesus from the dead. The significance or meaning of Jesus' resurrection will be given by the religio-historical context in which it occurs. It comes as God's vindication of Jesus' radical personal claims for which he was condemned as a blasphemer. It gives us reason to believe that Jesus was, in fact, just who he claimed to be. Thank you, Bill. You've left us even more time for questions, I believe, um, which is great. Um, let's welcome Peter. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks, Bill, and good evening, everybody. Um, I'll uh, try, as, as I promised, to stay in my time slot. I've cut out most of my slides, and I need the clicker, so let me see if I can just get all the technology working here. Um, look, let me give just a quick summary uh, before I start of uh, what I plan to do. Um, um, I'm um, going to agree um, and concede with most of what Professor Craig has said, um, uh, and even strengthen his arguments in order to show that the conclusion doesn't follow. So, um, uh, for example, I'll uh, grant uh, his central argument, the main case that he was making was the biblical historical evidence, the testimonies of the Gospels and all of the converging history. Uh, I'm going to concede all of that. Um, there's a lot to argue about, but I'm not a, a scholar of uh, the, the texts, and uh, I want to show that the cases against uh, the, that Christ uh, was raised from the dead is, is much stronger because it's not a historical issue. Um, I'll grant the key assumption that... Uh, um, Professor Craig calls the real question concerning the existence of God. I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, but for the sake of the discussion, I'm going to even concede uh, God's existence to show that the case doesn't uh, turn quite on, on, on it the way that, uh, that Bill says. And uh, far from having an aversion to miracles, although I'm an atheist and I have strong views about miracles, I want to explain that uh, um, I'm perfectly happy to accept miracles in a certain precise sense of that term. And I want to show that none of this gives grounds for believing that Jesus uh, was raised from the dead. So let me begin. Which of these buttons do I press? Is that the one? No, that's not the one. The forward one. That looks like it. Okay. Look, I want to start in a way that um, um, is familiar to me because of a course that I've been teaching for many years on Galileo, but it's relevant here. As you know, Galileo had a big clash with the church. And one of the things that he did was write, um, without going into my full-blown lecture on Galileo, he, uh, I'm tempted to read a very famous letter that he wrote uh, to uh, the Grand Duchess, the mother of uh, uh, Grand Duke uh, Cosimo de, uh, de Medici II, um, a famous letter to Christina. And he explained something which uh, I want to... Uh, pass on that's relevant to our debate. I want to just read bits of it, so i see if I can just uh, press through. I'm sorry, I'm, I've cut out all my slides, so it's not up there. Um, I'm going to just read parts of it. Um, he said, the intention of the Holy Ghost and the Scriptures is to teach how one goes to heaven, not how the heavens go. By this he meant that the Scriptures are not a scientific text, and the purpose of the, the Holy Scriptures is mor morality and, and how to live a, a, an appropriately good life. 
And he said, nor is God any less excellently revealed in nature's actions than in the sacred statements of the Bible. In other words, he says, God is the author of nature and the world as well as the scriptures, the texts. And so he says, we ought to begin not from the authority of scriptural passages, but from sense experience and necessary demonstrations, meaning scientific investigations, for the Holy Bible and the phenomena of nature proceed alike from the divine word. So God is the author of both the way the world looks and the scriptures, and he makes an important point uh, as part of this letter to Christina. He says, I do, not feel, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed me with senses, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. He would not require us to deny sense and reason in physical matters which are set before our eyes and minds by direct experience or necessary demonstrations, meaning science. He says that the science can't be simply overruled or discounted on the basis of the scriptural texts. Of course, that's why he got into a lot of trouble. But it's clearly relevant here. And so um, I want to show how the same issues arise. And of course, in a very famous uh, way, they've been raised by the philosopher, one of the greats of the Western tradition, David Hume. It's relevant for me to go through, this would be very familiar to, to, to Bill, of course, as a professor of philosophy and some of you, but this is one of the classics in the Western tradition. Um, relevant to us is this essay um, on miracles, which is uh, section 10 of his uh, inquiry. And I want to read bits of that to tell you how David Hume, quite uh, controversially, as you can imagine, at the time um, in uh, 1784, I think it was, 1748, uh, wrote against the plausibility and the credibility of miracles. Specifically, he mentions, of course, the raising of Jesus from the dead. And among the things he says, again, I'll just give you the highlights and the, the punchlines, so to speak. He says, it's acknowledged on all hands that the authority, either of the scripture or of tradition, is founded merely on the testimony of the apostles. The testimonies and the evidence that uh, Bill has set out. Who were eyewitnesses to those miracles of our saviour, by which he proved his divine mission. But he adds, our evidence, our evidence then, for the truth of the Christian religion is less than the evidence for the truth of our own senses. Because even in the first orders of the religion, it was no greater. Our testimony, our, our evidence rather, after 2,000 years, is rather less than it was even in the, the eyes of the, the witnesses themselves. And my re response to, to Professor Craig, to Bill, is that um, really largely to, to rehearse the famous arguments of David Hume, which I think remain powerful and I, sense, I think quite decisive in the broader picture of what we can believe rationally. Um, he has one of the phrases that I think is worth repeating as a kind of summary of his view. He says, a wise man therefore proportions his belief to the evidence. Now, of course, in the light of what um, uh, Bill has, has set out, the evidence is not just historical. And as you see from my quote from Galileo, I want to show that there's a lot of other evidence that bears uh, directly on whether we can believe the scriptures and, and all of the historical evidence, which I'm happy to concede, as I've indicated. Um, in this case, uh, we have the witnesses and, and, and all the evidence of 2,000 years ago, but this must be balanced against, as Hume says, conclusions as are founded on an infallible experience, which he means, uh, by which he means our scientific laws. He says, defines a miracle as follows. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. He wants to make the point very strongly that there can be no stronger argument against any claim miracle than the fact that it contravenes our scientific laws because that's the most certain knowledge we have of anything. This has to be qualified and there's a lot of debate exactly on how strong Hume's argument is but I haven't got time to go into that. Um, it may be too strong in some ways but we may get to it in discussion. A central point of Hume's argument is, quote, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a, a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavours to establish. If you think it's more miraculous that all that evidence um, would be false that is cited in the history and the Gospels, then you have a balance. He always says you, a wise man uh, proportions his belief to the evidence. You have to think that it's more miraculous that all that is false than that the laws of nature have been contravened. And I think that's a tough call. Um, so a central point is that uh, no testimony is sufficient unless uh, it's of a kind that the, mir the, the falsehood would be more miraculous. And he ends the chapter in the following, and I'll just quote. His central point, he returns to it. I desire anyone to lay his hand upon his heart and after serious consideration declare whether he thinks that the falsehood of such a book supported by such a testimony would be more extraordinary and more miraculous than all the miracles it relates. 
someone raised from the dead, or any other miracle you choose to, 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 to cite, you have to ask yourself, lay your hand on your heart, whether, whether the testimony is more, uh, its falsehood would be more miraculous than the, the event. That's a simple choice, and it's a pretty easy one to make. So let me go to a further point on here. I want to talk about what's been des described as the inalienable right of the historian. Um, I want to talk about the historian versus the committed believer, and I'm going to cite um, a famous uh, uh, scholar of the um, um, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and the early uh, Christianity that was actually mentioned in passing uh, by Professor Craig. Despite Professor Craig's detailed overview of the evidence from the Gospels, he has on his own account, I think, failed to distinguish the biblical, what the biblical scholar, Geza Vermesh, referred to as the Jesus of history as opposed to the divine Christ of the Christian faith. These are two very different personages. And the uh, Jesus of history is quite different from the Christ of the Christian faith. And the attitudes we should adopt are very different if you take yourself to be first and foremost a scholar and, and a historian as opposed to a believer. Let me quote from, from Vermesh. He says, when a committed Christian embarks on such a task, meaning the analysis of the available evidence, without fear or favour, he is bound to read the Gospels in a particular manner and to attribute the maximum possible Christian tra traditional significance, even to the most neutral sentence, one that in any other context he would not be even tempted to interpret that way. Now, of course, I'm suggesting that Professor Craig is doing just that, as many of you will, because you come to the texts not as uh, the disinterested um, historian, but as a committed believer. By contrast, Vermesh says, against both these viewpoints and against Christian and Jewish denominational bias, I seek to reassert in my approach, my whole approach to the problem, the inalienable right of the historian to pursue a course independent of beliefs. This may be difficult because many of us have very deep commitments to beliefs, but I think both in religion and politics, uh, difficult as it is, it's important. So let me talk now about um, uh, history versus science. Is that my next slide? Yeah. Um, Professor Craig's entire focus in his paper is the historical, mainly scriptural evidence, such as it is. And I don't want to dispute it, although I think it may be disputed. But I want to suggest that the question before us is not an historical question at all, as Professor Craig kind of concedes in passing when he mentioned his key presuppositions on which his case rests, namely the existence of God and the possibility or the probability of miracles. We haven't got time to go into the arguments for God, as he rightly points out, but I want to point to the logic of the argument and the dependence on these presuppositions. The question before us then is inescapably, as Professor Craig acknowledges in those fleeting comments, a question about rational belief, given the evidence and our overall background knowledge of the world, which is exactly as he puts it, but it's not just historical context. This includes other kinds of evidence that are relevant to the question before us, uh, indicated by Hume. The question, did Jesus rise from the dead, is not fundamentally a historical question at all, but a scientific question. Let me illustrate the point with an example that makes it perfectly clear. And I've got a slogan there, it's already up there for you to see. I've got a summary. Science trumps history. It doesn't matter what history says. If science says it's impossible, then it doesn't matter what the historical evidence is. That's the kind of take-home message. Let me illustrate the example that I think will make it perfectly clear. Now, this is unreadable, and I won't try to read it out to you. Uh, you need to try, perhaps. But I had it up here as an example. If I'd had more time, I would have tried to give you a different historical case, which would run exactly the same line that Professor Craig has run, and I would give you all the textual historical scholarship and all the agreement of the scholars, but in this case, it's about the Mexican uh, deity, the feathered serpent, Quetzalcoatl. Professor Craig, remember I cited Quetzalcoatl last time we met. Um, it's my favourite example because I think it serves a very useful purpose here. Now, I could read it out, but because of time I won't read it out, but it's essentially giving you the documentary sources and the scholars and all of the Mayan texts and this extraordinary uh, belief of all of the followers of Quetzalcoatl and in his miracles and that he would also rise and he was a creator. And there's a whole story to be told. We haven't got time for it and it's not relevant for me to go into the details, but it was kind of interesting, and perhaps you can find this sort of thing, to look through it with the eyes of, as in your case, I'm certain, not as a believer. You're going to be reading this, as Gezel Vermesh recommends, as a disinterested um, scholar, and of course you won't believe a word of it. And that's the point. You should be honest here, and I think we can all agree. I mean, there's always somebody who puts their hand up and agrees to being a Mexican believer in Quetzalcoatl in the audience, but I'm assuming that most of you are not. Um, you don't care what the foremost historians and scholars say about the reliability of the sources. You don't believe any of this about Quetzalcoatl, and you're sceptical for all the right reasons that Geza Vermesh noted. In that case, because you don't care about Quetzalcoatl, 
you understand perfectly well that the miracles and so on have to be explained in some other way, no matter how many people claim they saw it, no matter what the texts say, and especially if they're 2,000 years old. These aren't even that old. So, again, the slogan that I've uh, um, used is that science trumps history, and you understand that perfectly well in these cases, except where you yourself have a kind of prior commitment. So, I've got a kind of a, a, a way of parodying this. Let's imagine, I'm going to concede much more to uh, the historical case, to Professor Craig, than, than any historian deserves. Imagine, you may know the story, in 1948 in the Qumran Caves in, 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 in uh, Palestine, um, a shepherd boy, a goat herd, discovered the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And so I'm going to make a kind of a, uh, a, a, a fantasy about that. Let's assume that not only the Dead Sea Scrolls, which have very important uh, documentary and textual evidence of early Christianity uh, and the Jews at the time, the, um, the scholars uh, have found, uh, as a result of another um, shepherd digging around there, something else hidden in the caves. They found a DVD. And the DVD is really a documentary film that was made of the resurrection and the whole history. Now, this is a silly joke on my part, but I'm trying to illustrate the point that let's assume, much more than the historians are entitled to, that everything is word for word exactly as the scriptures say. That the, and I pick this just as a way to dramatise it. Imagine this was a documentary film, it doesn't have to be this one, but everything is vividly portrayed as uh, you see it, let's say, in, in a dramatic film like this. Um, the point to be made here is that uh, the empty tomb in particular, which uh, Professor Craig emphasises, I'm not disputing any of that. Um, the question is, uh, as, as Professor Craig says about the evidence, um, if no plausible natural explanation can account for all of the evidence, as well as the resurrection hypothesis, we're justified in inferring Jesus' resurrection is the best explanation of the fact, and I think, yes, exactly. So the question I'm going to ask in Hume's words, I want you to put your hand on your heart, as Hume says, and tell me that the only conceivable, only plausible explanation of all the events portrayed in this movie now, this documentary film, which shows all of the, the terrible... Uh, uh, suffering and, and, and all of that stuff, the resurrection. It shows the empty cave, it shows everything. I've watched enough, you know, uh, Law and Order and lots of uh, detective movies to know that whatever the f story that's told, there's always some other way of explaining it. And so I'm asking you to put your hand on your heart and say that there's only one explanation, a miraculous one that's contrary to all the laws of nature. Nobody, I think, can seriously maintain that the only plausible explanation of the facts, the observed events, they're the things that need to be explained because the miracle is an explanation of the facts. The facts I'm not disputing. I'm asking what's the best explanation. And the question is whether Jesus being raised from the dead is, is the only one. In fact, it's obvious that any explanation you can think up, and it's not hard to think of them, that's consistent with science is rationally preferable and overwhelmingly more plausible on the only criteria for plausibility that we have, our best scientific knowledge of the world. That was Hume's point. And that's why you don't believe any authoritative historical scholarship about Quetzalcoatl or anybody else. And that's why you shouldn't believe the historical evidence for the resurrection. So let me move to, uh, quickly if I can, the presuppositions that the case depends on. Um, Professor Craig points out that the real question, um, and I think he's right, is the question of the presupposition of, of God's existence. How open are you to the existence of God? Well, I, I've said I'm not at all, but it's important to note the logical form of Professor Craig's position. It's a conditional statement. If God exists, then Jesus probably rose from the dead. As he put it, the real question is how open are you to the existence of God? But here too, I'm willing to concede fully Professor Craig's crucial assumption that uh, God exists. I don't think the arguments are persuasive, the first cause arguments, the cosmological arguments, teleological, but let's accept that God exists. And let's ac accept his, his um, uh, omnipotence and all the other properties. The question I've got to ask is, how do you get the resurrection and Christianity from these premises? Even if God caused the Big Bang, and, and, and he's a designer of, of the, the fine-tuning of the universe, the question is, how do you get the resurrection from this? There are a lot of premises missing in this argument. If God did cause the universe and a designer, none of uh, the Christian uh, uh, specifics of the resurrection and the, and the raising of, of, of Jesus from the dead follows from any of that. There's a lot missing in the argument. And if God designed and created the universe, you might just as well say Quetzalcoatl performed all his miracles and returned from the dead because they're just as probable on this account. Um, and of course, uh, I don't think we accept that. So, again, we can understand the logic of Professor Craig's argument if we see it in another context. You can make the same argument. If aliens exist, then they, the, we can explain the pyramids. Or you can make uh, your own examples of this. And so the argument really is missing a lot of uh, premises that are required to, to accept the conclusion that we want. Um, so, again, if Quetzalcoatl 
Uh, if God exists, Quetzalcoatl could have done his miracles. How do you know it's our favorite miracles that are the ones that God chose to, to make for us? Why not for the, the Mexicans or somebody else? So let me f go finally to the question about miracles, the aversion to miracles. Um, Professor Craig says the only reason the skeptic rejects the resurrection hypothesis is because of his aversion to miracles. Well, one thing to say is what better do you need? I mean, an aversion to miracles is a pretty rational response for the reasons that Hume has given and I've indicated, but I want to show we can be more subtle than that because we have to be careful about how we understand a miracle, how we define it. Um, this is a, to say an aversion to miracles is a pejorative way to talk about what is rational belief and the unwillingness or the skepticism, the unwillingness to believe things which are contrary to our best science. But I want to show that we need to be more subtle about this. Um, in, in one context, if we only go so far, the only alternative to our best beliefs are worse ones. But I want to show how open-minded I am and to show that really we can accept miracles. And in fact, I do, for interesting reasons. Um, I'm even willing to accept uh, the uh, occurrence of miracles if we understand miracles a little bit more in a more refined way. The framework of our discussion is too narrow and we've been accepting a simplistic picture, essentially the picture of Hume in his essay. Professor Craig and Hume both accept the definition but just vote differently. You know, one says miracles are not possible and the other says they're possible, but it's a bit more complicated. Um, the idea of the violations of laws of nature actually is interesting because the laws of nature are violated all the time. The resurrection of Christ is not the only miracle that we might want to think about. So I want to show why we don't have to reject them out of hand. Um, let me just perhaps skip to the next slide. Um, let me explain about hypotheses. Professor Craig talks about the resurrection hypotheses. There are lots of hypotheses, and this happened to be a cover of a New Scientist magazine some years ago, where it says there are 13 things that don't make sense. In other words, actually our current science cannot explain a whole bunch of stuff. That's why we do research. That's why we apply for funding grants. These are actually strictly violations of the laws of nature, in the sense that they don't fit. We don't call them miracles because they don't come in a religious context, but the logic and their status are the same. Of course, the point is we don't pretend to understand everything. Of course, as I say, we don't call them miracles. We call them anomalies. That's the kind of philosophical or technical term, which are precisely hypo hypotheses that are putative violations of the known laws of nature. So if you're serious about the uh, question of miracles in a, this fundamental sense, then there have been lots of miracles and still are lots of anomalies that we want to explain besides the resurrection. And there are lots of cases in the history of science when recalcitrant observations couldn't be fitted in to the available scientific theories and appeared occult or miraculous in the technical sense. So, for example, Isaac Newton famously was embarrassed by the existence of gravity because although he famously came up with the most wonderful explanation of the laws of gravity, gravi uh, gra gravitational att attraction, it was fundamentally occult because it was action at a distance and that wasn't supposed to happen according to the understanding of science. I'm picking one or two random examples. Um, as I say, the laboratories of the world are full of things that can't be explained by current science. I think I've got a couple of slides. I picked this from my university's um, you know, advertising. The labs are full of uh, things that are currently unexplained. Here's another page of just random pictures about the wonders of science that can't be explained by current science, by current laws. So that's why we apply for research grants. And the question is, what would Professor Craig or any of you recommend to do in the case of things that don't fit? We don't think God intervened every time we don't understand something. We say we're going to get the next research grant and work on it. Um, so we're confronted with exceptions to our laws all the time, but mostly they're integrated into the existing framework. But there are the interesting cases, which I haven't got time to give you a full lecture on, where occasionally, I'll jump through that, um, there was the famous case of the uh, perihelion of Mercury, which couldn't be explained by Newton. It never did fit the laws of nature. What happens? We have scientific revolutions. Occasionally, the miracles, which are strictly the violations, actually force us to change our laws of nature, and there's a whole literature on the structure of scientific revolutions and how those scientific revolutions happen when things don't fit. Again, this is a long story, which I can't give you here. There's this whole picture, and you have anomalies on the uh, right-hand side there, which are technically the same as miracles. So... Really, the question of whether Jesus rose from the dead is one of many miracles we have to consider, but it's a question of which miracles you want to take seriously. And as I said, I'm, as far as I'm aware, nobody's applying for research funding grants to explain the anomaly of the resurrection. We understand that there are better explanations. We can think of lots of plausible explanations. Let me end, then, finally, on another, perhaps, uh, uh, cheeky uh, analogy. Uh, Professor Craig's point in fact three, as I noted a moment ago, was on the origin of the movement of Christianity and the believers of uh, the followers of Jesus. That needs to be explained. Well, again, I don't think it's a deep mystery. Let me give you it by way of an analogy. 
There was a movie, if my slide comes up, oh no, that's just a revolution, I've got a few more slides in there. Einstein showed that empty space is curved, so I put that in. Um, there was a movie in the 50s, 1952, Viva Zapata, I don't know if you saw it, Marlon Brando playing the, what was really a, a case of a revolutionary, in fact a seditious revolutionary hero inciting the people against their rulers. There's certain interesting parallels here. Um, at the end of the movie, though, uh, Zapata is brutally murdered by the military authorities. He's lured uh, into a certain situation, and he's shot to death by this huge fusillade of rifle fire, hundreds of rounds of rifle fire, and he's killed. But the film ends in an interesting way, which is rather moving. Um, it ends with his devoted followers reporting to have seen him afterwards in the village and the surrounding countryside. And we understand why, and we don't think it's a big deal. Thank you very much. Uh, you said, if I remember, that uh, there were three good, reliable, historical uh, reasons supporting the view that Jesus really did rise from death. The empty tomb, the appearances, the fact of the uh, explosion of Christianity. But then you went on briefly to um, say, in your conclusion, that whether this historical assertion uh, would be accepted by someone um, was largely based on a prior conviction about the existence of God. Now, I've heard a lot of Christians argue the kind of the other way. They argue from Jesus' resurrection to the existence of God. Um, you didn't seem to do that. And, and so my question is, do you think there is any validity when Christians do that, that source of argument? And, and why didn't you go there? If, if you think there is some validity, why didn't you go there tonight in your presentation? Right. I think that that's possible. You could argue for the existence of God on the basis of the evidence for a very credible miracle, that the best explanation of this miracle, like the resurrection, is that God exists. But it seems to me that that approach is neither necessary nor the easiest. Uh, the traditional approach to a question like the resurrection of Jesus, the one, as I say, taken by people like Hugo Grotius, Samuel Clark, William, William Paley, and others, is that you first do natural theology. And natural theology will give you a kind of generic theism that would be common to Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or Deism. And then you would turn to specific evidences regarding Jesus and the Gospels to narrow down those monotheisms to a specifically Christian monotheism. And it seems to me that that sort of approach is much easier because you've already got the existence of God in your background information when it comes to explaining the resurrection. Rather than having to add God's existence, that would be one more um, independent fact for which there isn't any independent evidence that you'd need to be adding. Whereas if that's already in your background information, that doesn't need to be added in as, a, as another fact that, for which there's no independent evidence. So it seems to me that the best approach is to first argue for the existence of God on the basis of these arguments of natural theology. And then with that in place, you now ask, has this God revealed himself in some specific way? And then you turn to these evidences, which I think are most probably explained by the best explained by the resurrection of Jesus, that God raised him from the dead. Thank you. You look puzzled. It, no, no. Does no, that make I'm, sense? Was I clear? I, I'm just a slow thinker, Bill. I'm just following along, processing. All right. yep. <laughs> I think I've got you. Okay. Um, give that to uh, Peter. Oh, sorry. Uh, you've only got two. So my question for you, Peter. Um, so it, it's 2015. Um, amazingly, this, this discovery of a DVD. Uh, it's in Aramaic, uh, but it's it's authentically translated, and and um, it's verified by all the best. Uh, experts in the world, um, and it's it's got the life of Jesus, and, and it's been following him around, and it's got his life and his teachings and all of that kind of thing. And you're not surprised, because on August 12th, 
2013 at UTS, you conceded as much. Um, now on it, Jesus' obsession with, uh, with going to Jerusalem and, and, and talking to his disciples about dying there and, and being raised there, that's all on there. Uh, these un unfold, actually, on the DVD. Again, no surprise to you. Um, and no surprise because uh, you have lots of plausible explanations. So could you just maybe articulate, say, three or four? Well, look, I'll try, but we can all do it. But is this working? Yeah. Um, look, you often don't have one. In lots of these cases I pick, things happen, and you don't have an explanation. That's just an honest thing to say. And so it's no embarrassment to say that, actually, I don't know what happened, but one thing I know for sure is it was no miracle. I mean, that's a perfectly honest thing to say. And, of course, in historical cases, I'm often asked, how do you explain something or other? Well, look, I have no idea, really. My point is a more fundamental one, is that I don't have to necessarily have a specific, even good explanation to know what counts as a better one and what counts as a worse one. That's the only first point I made. Now, I mean, if I tried, as we can all do, there have been movies that have tried this as well. Look, the fact that the cave is found empty, you know, I can make up stupid stories. I mean, we can all think up, you know, he wasn't really dead, his friends came and took him away, and look, I don't know, I can make up silly stories. My point is more fundamental and more important. You can easily think of a scenario that would make a movie or a detective story, as we do, that no matter how the evidence looks, there's always a backstory that turns out things are quite different. It's not an unfamiliar point to make. And I don't think any of these uh, uh, evidences, as I say, even if you accept them fully, warrant resorting to the most unlikely explanation that you can even imagine because there's one reason you, could, you can do that when you've exhausted all the other possible plausible explanations and as I say if you put your hand on your heart I actually don't believe anybody who tells me they cannot they've exhausted every possible plausible explanation within the, the realm of science and then you're left with only the miraculous account I'm having trouble with that one okay I, I kind of felt like you evaded me but sorry I kind of felt like you evaded the actual. Oh, oh so, I, so, I thought I was answering. So you said, no, 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 there's, there's anything could have happened. I can't name you something. You want me to give a specific yeah, story? That's well, what. okay, I'll make one up. I mean, uh, I say, you know, Jesus didn't die. We thought he looked dead. People, that happens. People look very dead. You know, the injuries weren't fatal. None of you know what really happened. We're talking about a ridiculously long time ago. Nobody had a medical, you know, examiner to do modern medicine on the guy. So he wasn't dead. So, you know, uh, he, he was taken to the cave and his friends came in the night and they took the cave, opened the cave and took him away. Look, you know, you know the sort of story one could make up. You're asking for another story and I'll just make up something. That's, that's a direct answer to your question. And I'm asking, really, it's posing a question. Isn't it not conceivable that something like that could have happened? That's the only question that I'm throwing back. If it's not even conceivable, then you may have to resort to a miracle. You know, in science and these other cases, we often really don't know how to explain some of these anomalies. And you know what? It's not an embarrassment to say, look, I don't know what's happened here. This is really bizarre, and that's why I gave those scientific examples. The honest position is to say, we don't know, we're working on it. But in this case, actually, I'm suggesting, I'm provoking you with the question, there's lots of possibilities that you can imagine. So that's an answer. Okay, so thank you for sending in your uh, texts. And uh, we'll start going on those, but uh, please send more in. Yes, I'll, 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 I'll give he's Bill still, a, a... He's delaying me, Peter. <laughs> I'll, I'll give Bill a... Uh, okay. So here we go. As the old joke goes, it's the University of Technology. Technology is catching up with us. Okay. What evidence is there against the hypothesis that the disciples hallucinated or similar Jesus' appearances? Bill, you mentioned this. Um, we often hear about uh, dead people appearing. Elvis is in the building, that kind of stuff. Um, we don't believe them, though. Um, it's uh, kind of... Peter's point, really, isn't it? Um, that there's any number of other possible explanations. So, on, sure. on, the, on the hallucinations in particular. It's important to understand that one isn't saying that there aren't other conceivable explanations. What one is arguing is that the best explanation is God raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, when you assess these other hypotheses, you find them 
typically to have narrower explanatory scope, weaker explanatory power, they're more ad hoc, uh, they're more implausible in various ways. Now, in my uh, published work, and again, you can look at the website for this, I go into a lengthy discussion of the hallucination hypothesis, and I think there are a number of problems with it. First and foremost, it has narrow explanatory scope. This is offered as an explanation of the post-mortem appearances of Jesus. But obviously, it does nothing to explain the empty tomb. In order to explain the empty tomb, you've got to conjoin some independent hypothesis to the hallucination hypothesis. The resurrection hypothesis, by contrast, is simpler and has broader explanatory scope and is therefore preferable. Moreover, the hallucination hypothesis doesn't really explain the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. Given their typical Jewish frame of mind, if the disciples were to have hallucinated visions of Jesus, they would have projected visions of Jesus in glory, in Abraham's bosom, where Jews believed the righteous dead went to await the resurrection at the end of the world. But given such visions of Jesus in glory, this would have at most led the disciples to proclaim not the resurrection of Jesus, but his ascension into heaven. He had been uh, translated by God into glory, and there they saw him, and he appeared to them. So that the, or the uh, hallucination hypothesis, though it's offered as an explanation of the post-mortem appearances, does nothing to explain the empty tomb, and it doesn't do a good job explaining the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. That's explanatory scope. Let me just add one more point with respect to explanatory power. It doesn't even do a very good job of explaining the, or the, uh, the post-mortem appearances. These were not to one person, but to many different persons. Not just to individuals, but to groups of people not just at one locale, under one circumstance, but in a variety of locales, under a variety of circumstances. Not just to believers, but even to unbelievers and even enemies. So that there is nothing in the psychological case books comparable to these resurrection appearances of Jesus. In order to assemble uh, some sort of parallel to them in the case books of psychology and, and hallucinatory experiences, you have to cobble together a number of different cases to try to make a composite picture to resemble the post-mortem appearances of Jesus. So in fact, the post-mortem appearances of Jesus are quite unlike hallucinatory experiences and I don't think is very well explained by uh, suggesting that they were mere hallucinations. Those are just a couple of points. Now, Peter, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you don't agree that the resurrection hypothesis has more scope or explanatory power than, than other hypotheses. No, Can because the reason is, uh, I agree with the framework. I mean, Bill's right about that approach. But that's why I made the point that it's not just history we're talking about. In, talk, in, in respect to uh, explanatory scope and coherence and all the virtues of explanations, that includes physics. That includes what we know about the world. And so historical explanations can't be taken out of the context of the most coherent, the most explanatory, the most comprehensive, all those virtues of explanations. That's what our science tells us. That's just really Hume's point. But if we elaborate Hume's point, is that we take into account all of the other considerations that are part of the broader explanatory issues, and it, it, then it's less uh, plausible. And if you do it the other way, then the coherence of historical explanations, I can go along with all of that, you see, because in terms of history, and I accept that the hallucination hypothesis is not particularly elegant or appropriate or plausible in its context. And I wouldn't pick that as the uh, alternative within the uh, framework of nature. So I'm, I'm insisting, in fact, that you cannot take these questions out of those explanatory virtues of science taken as a whole. Do you have a comeback on the, on the Hume argument? Yes, I do, and that's in my response that I, I hope to read. But um, it seems to me that what Professor Slezak is raising is the probability of the resurrection considered on our background information, which will include our knowledge of the laws of physics, uh, chemistry, and so forth. And probability theory would require that the 
probability of the resurrection on the background information alone, that is to say abstracting from the evidence for the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith, will be the product of two other probabilities. One would be the probability of God on the background information alone times the probability of the resurrection on God's existence. And that's why Professor Slixa was right to say this raises questions about God's intentions uh, and so forth. So the first would be how probable is the existence of God just on the background information? And here, as I explained, I think the probability of God is very good on the background information because my background information will include things like the cosmological, teleological, axiological arguments that make the probability of God on the background information alone um, pretty high. Um, now, what about the probability of the resurrection given that God exists? How probable is it that God would raise Jesus from the dead if God exists? Well, this is probably inscrutable, but I don't think that the skeptic can say that it's low. I don't see how the skeptic could justifiably say that given God's existence, it's improbable that God would raise Jesus from the dead, especially when you consider um, the historical context in which this event is alleged to have taken place, namely the radical personal claims and unparalleled ministry of Jesus himself. It seems to me that given those facts, the skeptic cannot say that it's improbable that God would raise Jesus from the dead if God exists. So, given that God's existence is probable on the background information, and it's not improbable that God would raise Jesus from the dead, it follows that the resurrection hypothesis is not improbable on the background information alone. Even given all the laws of physics and so forth, this doesn't go to show that it's improbable that God raised Jesus from the dead. Just one more point before you respond, and that is, I would agree the hypothesis, Jesus rose naturally from the dead, is highly improbable on the background information. That would be against all the laws of, of physics, but it's not contradicting any laws of physics to say God raised Jesus from the dead. So that probability seems to me to be not at all, uh, I should say it seems to me the improbability of that is not at all demonstrated to be high. Can I follow up that with a quick, just to yeah, follow up? Sure. Look, then let's say I go along with you that far. The question is, forgive me, but then what about the probability that Quetzalcoatl rose on the same background information, God's omnipotence? And it seems to me the arguments are so parallel that you're stuck with having to say to a Mexican, well, yeah, but your miracle is not probable given the same background information. Yes, I, this was one of the things that um, gave me reflection as I read your response and found it very interesting. Here again, I would say that the uh, probability of Quetzalcoatl on the background information is not very high. It's low. That's because you're not he, a Mexican. No, no, it's not just because of that. It's because he, his existence is incompatible with those very theistic arguments that I talked about. If Quetzalcoatl is not just a name, but is a feathered serpent deity, then that's incompatible with the arguments for the existence of God on the basis of the creation of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, and things of that sort. That makes it highly improbable that God is this feathered serpent deity. Moreover, it seems to me that the background information does not include anything about the historicity of Quetzalcoatl as a real historical person. On the contrary, this is mythology in contrast to the Gospels. It's so rude to the Mexicans. Pardon me? It's so rude to the Mexicans. I know, I don't mean to be offending anybody, but, but let's, let, let me turn to a different example. If a Muslim were to claim that Muhammad had done miracles, then I would say, I, I cannot say that's improbable on the basis of the background information, because the Muslim has a concept of God that does fit the background information, and uh, there is historical data that Muhammad was a genuine historical person. So I would say whether or not Muhammad did miracles would need to be assessed on the basis of the evidence, not just the background information. And that's where Hume really failed. Hume 
didn't understand, because the probability calculus hadn't been yet developed in his day, that you needed to consider how probable is the evidence given that, say, no resurrection occurred as compared to if the resurrection did occur. So I would be, um, while I would be skeptical about the Mexican uh, feathered serpent uh, deity, uh, possibly offending ancient Aztecs, um, I wouldn't offend Muslims because I would say that you cannot uh, just dismiss Islamic claims of miracles on the basis of the background information alone. You've got to look at the specific evidence and weigh that. We, we keep using this word miracles, and, and the mm. questions actually come up. You said something very interesting in your, in your previous thing, which you said um, God raising Jesus from the dead. You, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You said that wouldn't uh, violate any laws of physics. Is that, is that how you put it? Uh, did I say that just now? No, no, no. I didn't say that in my talk, I know. No, no, no. no. In the previous uh, in the previous. Right. Oh, answer. in the previous exchange. Yes. yes. Right. And, and this is a key point that I don't agree with Hume that miracles are violations of the laws of nature. So, you so you ha you have, you're working with different definitions of miracle. So... Well, I, th I assumed that we would agree on that. I was not wanting to disagree about that. I'm assuming that God raising Jesus from the dead is, is an intervention of the deity yes. precisely contrary to the laws of nature. Well, I wouldn't... How is, that in, how is that consistent with the laws of nature? Because the laws of nature, I think, have built in them implicit uh, ceteris paribus conditions. That is to say, all things being equal. Uh, the laws of nature describe what will happen if no natural or supernatural agency is intervening in the situation. And so a law of nature isn't violated when a miracle occurs because a law of nature only describes what uh, would take place were no um, intervention of a deity to be involved. I can agree with it if you put it that way. If, if God intervening in the normal running of things is not a violation of the laws of nature, then we're, we're sort of agreeing with them. We're yes. quibbling about how we define the laws of nature. You want to define the laws of nature to include God's intervention. No, 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 I don't. I don't. What I'm saying is that the laws of nature describe what will naturally occur under with, various circumstances. But those circumstances include God coming No, in. no, they wouldn't. Okay. So what, this is the way I would define a law of nature is, or not a law of nature, but a miracle rather. I would say a miracle is an event which happens, which is incapable of being explained by the natural causes that are operative at that time and place in question. So it's an event wrought by God, which is naturally impossible. But it doesn't violate the laws of nature, strictly speaking. Now, that may seem like a, a semantic point, but it's very important because I actually think the idea of a violation of a law of nature is incoherent because the laws of nature are universal generalizations. And so if something happened to violate them, it wouldn't be a law. But it my, would, the law would be revised. But my question is that when you're faced with a particular event that you don't know how to explain, yes. the question for both of us and all of us is how you choose to explain it and whether you advert to right. the deity's invention or you don't. And I've given right. lots of examples where you're faced with things that you can't explain yes. given the current framework. Yes. And the question is why you would in some particular, I mean, I parried it a little bit by saying uh, you could go up to every laboratory that's currently got yes. inexplicable things and say, look, it's okay, I know how it happened, God did it. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Peter, and, and I didn't address that in my paper. And these are the kinds of helpful questions that can ferret out these, these issues. In my published work, um, here's my take on that. A miracle without a context is inherently ambiguous as to whether this is just a scientific anomaly or an event wrought by God. And that's the difficulty with Hume's illustration of the resuscitation of Queen Elizabeth, yeah. is that it occurs without any sort of significant religio-historical context and therefore appears as a bald anomaly. The meaning of the resurrection and it's, it's the clue to its being a miracle rather than a freak of nature or a scientific anomaly is the religio-historical context in which it occurs, which is, I think, pregnant with significance. It comes as the climax to Jesus' own unparalleled life and ministry and the radical personal claims by which he put himself in the place of God 
and for which he was crucified as a blasphemer. If this man has been raised from the dead, then I think that the God he was allegedly blaspheming has publicly and unequivocally vindicated those allegedly blasphemous claims. And it would be improbable to say, oh, this is just a freak of nature that just happened to occur at this very time. I think it's far more plausible, given the religio-historical context, to say, wow, this was indeed a miracle. Now, you, you're basing that on, again, the, the, the gospel evidence. Well, the religio-historical context yeah. is and, given and Jesus, by the gospel and evidence, claims, and that was why I said that my second presupposition was, in addition to the existence of God, was that we have a good deal of information about the historical Jesus. But that's not an unjustified assumption. I mean, it's a presupposition for tonight's talk. But in my published work, I go into this in great detail as to who Jesus understood himself to be and what sort of personal claims did he make about himself. And, and so I'm quite prepared to argue for those presuppositions. But in approaching this topic, those are the presuppositions that I bring with me to assess the evidence. Can I just add one thing to that too? Look, the problem that you're confronting then is, let's accept that framework. You've got too many to explain now. There's lots of religio-historical frameworks yes. in which miracles are claimed to happen, and then you've got to go around and figure out which ones you want to accept and which ones you don't. People yeah. are claiming miracles all the time in religio I mean, you know, everybody goes to Lourdes or wherever they go. Um, you're agreeing. I mean, you've got a lot to yeah, sort you're, out. You're right. I, I, I think that there's no way to adopt in advance a kind of rule that will enable or will, will help you avoid the hard work of assessing these things on a case by case basis. I, I, I do think that's right. You're just stuck with, with saying I've got to look at the evidence, but that's the way the historian works. Okay, so we, we are getting quite a few questions through on that second presupposition. So questions like, you mentioned the word independence a lot in the, yes. uh, in the gospel witness. Can you uh, give a little bit more explanation about how you can be certain that they were independent? Right. Also, a question about outside of those sources, are there uh, extra historical uh, evidence uh, to you back you up? You mean extra biblical? Extra biblical, sorry. Um, with respect to extra biblical sources, there are extra biblical sources for Jesus. I mentioned that he's referred to in Roman and Jewish and extra biblical Christian sources. But these sources, by the very nature of the case, tend to be secondary, later, and less reliable than the primary source documents. And that's why I encouraged you tonight not to think of the New Testament as a single book, but to think of it as what it originally was, just a bunch of separate documents written in the Greek language, handed down out of the first century telling this story. And the question is, how reliable are these documents? Whether they're in or out of the New Testament is irrelevant. It, it doesn't make any difference to the historian because he's not treating them as some sort of inspired or holy book or documents. And the, the primary sources for Jesus were collected eventually later into the New Testament. Now, with respect to independence, this is a key fact because one of the most important historical criteria is to have m multiple sources for an event which are independent of each other. That makes it much less likely that the event was just made up, right? You see the logic of that. And the Gospels, um, to a degree, are dependent upon each other. M the vast majority of scholars think that Matthew and Luke used the Gospel of Mark in writing theirs so that they knew Mark. Mark was the first Gospel. Matthew and Luke used Mark in writing their own, but then John is independent of the other three. Doesn't that automatically just reduce the number of independent sources? It would, you, but... You mentioned but, up to six. Right, that's right, see. And this is where New Testament scholars then go further by going behind the Gospels to the sources that the evangelist used. And when I talk about independence, I'm not talking about the independence of the Gospels, but the sources that they used in writing their Gospels, like the pre-Mark and Passion source. Matthew's peculiar source for the guard at the tomb, remember, that's not from Mark. It's not in Mark. Luke's peculiar source that included the, 
disciples' visit to the empty tomb to verify the women's report, that's not from Mark. So that's not something that he was dependent for upon Mark. Now, somebody might say, well, Luke just made it up. No, because it's independently attested in John. So you see how it goes. By identifying these various sources, you can determine which events enjoy multiple independent early attestation. And this is the way historical scholars work to try to uncover those historical nuggets about someone like Jesus that can be established by historical inquiry. Now, Peter, you tried to very much compare the, the uh, feathered serpent stories uh, with, with these accounts, stories, are there similar sorts of um, background to the, to, the, to the accounts and things like that? Or? Look, I'm much less of a scholar of Quetzalcoatl even than of, of biblical stuff. Uh, it's not my tradition. But look, I pick it uh, to be provocative in a rhetorical way to make the point that I did make, which is that it didn't matter if there were, and there probably are, because I went, as one does, to Wikipedia or somewhere, and you find an enormous amount of scholarly, historical uh, uh, discussions of the sources of the, the, the Mayan uh, hieroglyphic writings and the codices as they talk about. Look, there's a whole literature. I tried to find something in order to make the parallel. I'm not claiming that there is uh, comparable uh, studies, but look, it's more recent, it's serious scholarship, and there are claims that are made which we simply don't take literally. It's a simple point, and I think it still stands in the light of no matter what of these detailed scholarship uh, uh, and textual studies show about the biblical period, I think they're enormously interesting, and I find everything that Bill says on this illuminating, and I learn from it. But the question is whether one draws the conclusion that you want to draw that it is in support of prior or in the other reverse way, as you said, evidence for God. And none of it is compelling. And, and the, what you need as a skeptic is to be given something that would, would draw you into accepting the fundamental uh, theological significance of all this stuff. So your favourite explanation, it seems, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, for, for, the, for the gospel accounts is just by your conclusion with that Marlon Brando movie, it, it's kind of a legend. Of course, of course. And it's sufficiently long ago that I don't find it an implausible way to deal with it. And in a way, look, I've often thought as an atheist, there's an asymmetry between an atheist and a believer often because I don't care how it turns out, actually. You know, I'm kind of really neutral, mainly with, with ministers. I've had this interesting uh, kind of position where I say, look, you know, uh, I have an advantage over you, I say, because I don't care if it comes out the other way. I'll go to church on Sunday. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like fine by me. But I'm looking for some grounds rationally to be persuaded. And I think that's appropriate. I mean, I often say that both in political debates, which I always think of, it's very bad to have a prior commitment. You should pretend you're from Mars. And then you ask yourself, which side would I be on if I came from Mars without a prior commitment? Here too, um, I'm not, in a way, somehow, in a prior sense, uh, averse to accepting a, a compelling case. I'm still waiting to hear it. So that's why I give these other examples where we don't feel the compulsion, and, and I explain for, because we do feel like we're from Mars. Now, the, lots of questions coming through. Ask Peter what the facts are. And is, has he just answered that? Because there's about five, ten questions along those lines. It's a legend. That's the answer, according to Peter. I, I thought you were willing in your paper to grant the historicity of the facts. Yes, yes, I am. I mean, for the sake of this discussion, the point I'm making now is that from somebody, from my point of view, I don't have to deny, that's why I give the silly story about the video. I mean, I'm willing to accept that the, the events as they occurred, occurred, but then the question we're debating is how best to explain them. Yes. And I think we agree on that framework, and so our argument isn't about the facts. That's why I, I'm happy to give you the full story. The okay. cave and everything. Okay, so, so just develop that a bit more because we, we do have some questions on this. You can see, yes, there's a God. You can see, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. But the connection between the two is a bit like Santa Claus and presents yeah, under the tree. Right. The existence of both does not connect the two. Yeah. That's, for, that was part of your argument, yes. is that right? Yeah, in the original version of the paper, I made these other silly analogies. Um, uh, for today's argument, I was willing to accept God's existence, and I'm pressing on Bill the question of given that background arguments for God based on cosmological and teleological arguments, I think you're conceding even that there's a long way to go before your particular favourite miracles uh, are established because um, given God, uh, anything could have happened. I mean, that's literally the point. And so, right. 
So then I'm left saying, why pick this particular historical thing opposed from any number of other things that you could equally explain on the basis of that same background evidence? And so I picked the silly example of, you know, uh, the, the aliens. If aliens exist, we can explain the pyramids. Well, you know, yeah, right. Doesn't the, if you can see the historical uh, reliability of the Gospels, doesn't that go, though, some way to the credibility of, of the man Jesus and his claims? Isn't, isn't, that a kind of, isn't that a kind of halfway step towards the God? It's, it's accepting him as an interesting man, and I like the Sermon on the Mount, and there's lots of stuff I like there. But that's like the Old Testament. There's a lot of good stuff in there. There's a lot of terrible stuff in there. Um, I don't have to accept it all. And in fact, the top scholars, that's why the Galileo example is very interesting. The whole point of that early point about Galileo was most of... You can't accept all of the, the Bible literally anyway, no matter who you are. You're going to make some judgments as to which bits of it you can take literally. Well, now that opens the gate to, to the scepticism, and then I'm just saying that there are lots of it that you can't accept, including the, the theological divine claims. So I'm not committed beyond uh, what I've said uh, from the concessions I've made. Bill, do you want to just explore that, that logic that Peter has made, that just because, if he, okay, he's considered Jesus rose from the dead, he's considered that God exists, but the, the link between those two... Concession. Well, this was what I was referring to as the religio-historical context that gives the clue to the interpretation of an event. I, I don't know of anybody, Peter, who sincerely believes that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, but that this is just a scientific anomaly. Oh, skeptics tried to deny the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, but I don't know of anybody who says, Yes, he rose from the dead, and this is just like a scientific anomaly that occurs in all the laboratories. It wasn't a miracle. Given the extraordinary nature of that event, its singularity in history, and its religio-historical context, I think it's very plausible that once the person grants that Jesus rose from the dead, then it's, it's really implausible to say, that this wasn't a miracle. But that's not one of the facts I'm granting. I mean, I'm not granting he rose from the dead. I'm granting the facts as they appeared. Okay. He may have appeared after he looked like he was dead. You understand? So, yes. so I'm not in the position of claiming that this is an anomaly. I'm saying this is an event that happened that has a perfectly okay explanation, perfectly ordinary explanation. Okay, well, I may have misunderstood your yeah. paper in that respect. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, there is a question here. Bill, uh, you, you mentioned very briefly uh, the cosmological, etc. <laughs> I, I, cosmological, theological, and one axiomatic? Axiological. axiological. Can you just give one, one quick uh, run through for, for one or two of those? Yes, actually, I can state these very succinctly, though their defense would require much elaboration. One version of the cosmological argument that I like very much goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And then you unpack what it is to be a cause of the universe, and a number of striking uh, theological attributes fall out. Peter, you remember these arguments from 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, second argument, the teleological. Premise one, the fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Premise two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. That gives you a cosmic designer of the universe. The axiological or moral argument goes like this. Um, objective moral values and duties exist, too. But if God did not exist, then objective moral values and duties would not exist. Three, therefore, God exists. So those three arguments together give you a creator and designer of the universe who is the locus and source of absolute goodness and moral duty, and, and, and is thus a very powerful um, cumulative argument for God. Peter, you mentioned okay. you're not convinced by any of this. Sorry. Partic you, you mentioned very briefly that you're not particularly convinced. Equally briefly, I suppose I should refute these very big... Look, it's a very big and interesting uh, discussion. Let me just go through them equally quickly. Um, 
the, the first causal cosmological argument, I think it's problematic. I think Bill in his writings and also has admitted that when we're talking about cause here, we have to be a bit careful. Cause as physics understands it, uh, meaning event, causation in time and so on. We're talking about the beginning of the universe before which there was no cause and our debate partly was about that. I think you have said uh, elsewhere that you mean cause in a metaphysical sense and my question is what the hell is that? So that's, you know, um, so, so anyway, that's, that's the kind of nature of that debate. The teleological argument, again, of course, I go back to Hume, as you'd be aware. Hume asks, you know, the idea, he has this phrase, what is this little agitation in our brain that we call purpose, that we ascribe to the whole universe? Purposes and, co and, and, and goals. The teleolog teleology is something that we, we find in, in human beings and other organisms that have, have brains. The idea that the whole universe is designed by a, a thoughtful being is an anthropomorphism. And, okay, so that's the short answer to, to the short summary. The axiological argument... Um, I agree with it in a way. There is nothing absolute about morals. It's a human construct. If there are no intelligences, there were no human desires, there were no human feelings, we wouldn't have uh, morality. And I think that's fine. We just have to bite the bullet on that. And, and uh, I know this has some uh, uncomfortable consequences. It's not to do with social consensus only. There's some deep biological roots in our uh, human love for one another. There are clearly other naturalistic ways to explain our moral sentiments. But going...